Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the early 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming my second guest from Back to the Future Part 2, and also second member of Griff's Gang, and I am talking about Darlene Vogel. Yes, Darlene Vogel is coming on the podcast today to talk about that movie and um, I'm going to ask her about several other roles that she's done. Uh, she was in, um, oh my God, so much great stuff. Ski School, Ring of Steel, and the Angel 4 Undercover. I haven't been able to get any of the angels on here, but finally I'm getting one, and I can't wait. It's going to be so fucking awesome. By the way, uh, if you don't uh, remember who Darlene is um, in Griff's Gang, she's the one with the with the um, rhino tusk ring who grabs Marty Jr. by the balls and says, What's the matter, McFly? You got no scrote? That's who she is. And so I can't wait to have her on today. And uh, happy St. Patty's Day to everyone during this crazy time of coronavirus. May you all get drunk and forget this day ever happened and this and temporarily forget that all this crap has happened. So uh, yeah, here is my interview with Darlene Vogel. Hey Darlene. Hi, how are you? I am great. How are you? I'm doing okay under the circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show. It's, it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Yeah, well, it's, it's fun to do. I'm glad I could be a part of it. Oh, that's awesome. So, going back in time, according to my research, you studied at New York's Fashion of Technology. Were you on the trajectory of working in the fashion world? No, I was actually studying cosmetics, fragrances, and toiletries, so I was going to work in, like, you know, the cosmetic business. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just wanted to be in New York. I didn't really know what I was going to study, and it was a new curriculum there, and they didn't really have it set in place. So everybody ended up dropping out and going into something else, and it's there where the guy on my floor knew a modeling agent and said, well, why don't you try modeling? And so I said, sure, I'll try anything. So that's what I did. I started to model, do showroom modeling, and... Um, then that went to print work, and then that went to commercial work, and then a manager saw me on a commercial, and that's how I got into acting. Mm -hmm. were, were you uh, modeling for magazines and catalogs and all that? Exactly, yeah, junior modeling, fashion shows, um, magazine catalogs, yeah, fitness stuff, things like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you do any, um, any acting studying in New York? Well, what's funny is I actually won a scholarship to the New York Academy of Theatrical Arts, and I didn't even really want to be an actor. I just thought, oh, this would be fun to do. So I commuted yeah. to the city from Connecticut three times a week to go to classes, and I was having a ball doing it, but I never really took it seriously. And uh, then when I started doing commercial work, and you know, I kept taking classes when I lived in New York, and um, then it just... You know, I was very green. I really didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. but I was getting work, and uh, so I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because every time I talk to somebody uh, who studied acting in New York, I always ask, you know, who was in their class that went on to become hugely successful and stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. I don't know if I have any stories like that, if anyone's been hugely successful in any of my classes, but... Um, yeah, I don't think I know of anyone, really. Mm -hmm. What kind of commercials did you do? Oh, well, my first national commercial was the Milk as a Body Good campaign, and I was a little <laughs> girl. And I also did Crystal Light and Ivory and Cars and um, what else did I do? Toothpaste. I mean, I've done over 200 commercials, so I can't remember all of them, but... Um, you know, the latest ones, now that I'm older, it's anything below the waist. <laughs> <laughs> like toilet paper and menopause and Cialis and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, oh my God, milk does the body good. I always thought that that was going to be around forever, but I guess 
in, in recent years, you know, people have realized that uh, milk is actually pretty fatty. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we shouldn't. Any, any of us should not be drinking cow's milk. We should be drinking other alternatives. <laughs> yeah, almond milk and all that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. I was drinking all, all the milk, and now they're saying not to drink all the milk because um, the bees are being exhausted by pollinating all these almond plants. So now I'm switching to oat milk, and I love that it actually even more. Mm hmm. Uh, I've never tried that before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what year did you move to LA? Um, I came out to LA in '88 for pilot season. And I stayed for about four months, and then I moved back to New York. I had kept my apartment in New York, and then I went, came back again in 89. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up, I still went back and forth, but um, my first acting job here was Charles in Charge. I was a guest star on that. Yeah. And then I just started working a little bit, but, in, but then my first movie um, was Back to the Future 2, and um, yeah, and then I just stayed stayed in LA because this is where all the work is in, the, in New York you did the equalizer I did oh right yeah that was a very small role I don't even know if that was a guest star maybe it was a co-star I can't remember but yeah I got to play with um the word Woodward which I did love that show yeah and there's actually some really good guest stars in that particular episode uh Vanessa Angel uh Annabelle Gerwich and Tony Gagnos who played meat in the Porky's movies Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. I know I should, I, I don't even have a, well, I might have a copy of that back in like a VHS form, but I don't have, I don't know where I could actually see that. Yeah. Was it, was, uh, was, um, what's, uh, Woodard, was he good to work with? He was a very, very nice guy. Yeah. Very nice. Mm-hmm. So I, had, I think I only had one scene, or maybe I had two scenes. I can't, you know, honestly, I can't even remember. Yeah, <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah. So how does uh, Back to the Future Part 2 come into your life? Well, well, the funny thing is I walked into my agency that day, and as I was leaving, my agency said, oh, man, how young do you think you <coughs> play? And I was like, I don't know, you know, 20, 19, whatever. He goes, oh, go in and meet this cast director as their cast for this movie and you know we didn't even know what it was for uh -huh. and um, so I went in and all I did was meet the casting director and talk with her and then didn't hear anything and then a month later they called me back in and um, I had to kind of do something with Ricky and Jason like improv and mm -hmm. then they called us all back in again I believe it was three times we went in within a three month period mm -hmm. so you know it's weird not to hear for that long of a time and then they said, okay, you got the part, and um, uh, it'll only be for two weeks. So I was like, cool. So, But every day that we shot took longer and longer because, you know, they were using this camera called the Tantra camera, or it was like a Tantra shot where it was a split screen, you know, when Michael was playing two different roles, so they had to split the screen, so there was a lot of setup mm -hmm. with lighting and things like that to make everything work. So the cafe scene took a month, and the flying scene took a month. So I was actually there for two months every day. Wow. So for two months, you were uh, filming that scene. Yeah. But a lot of it was a lot of sitting around, a lot of sitting around. And that's where I really got to be friendly with Ricky and Jason. You know, we would just hang out all together and have a ball and... Michael was always just so giving and so nice, and he'd make margaritas in his trailer and, <laughs> and margaritas at the end of the day. He was just, you know, everyone on that. It became such a family. Yeah, I've talked to Ricky. He's a very interesting guy, very hyper, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're still really good friends. I mean, after all these years, it's, it's wonderful. I love him and his wife, and his kids are amazing. I actually set up his daughter with her boyfriend that she's been with for three years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not intentionally, but it, it all worked out. Wow, I wish someone played matchmaker for me. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you a fan of the original? No, not really. I mean, I don't even I don't even think it had come out yet when we were filming it. I, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, back I to... I never was back. really a Back to the Future 
fan. Um, I thought it was a fun movie and everything. But And then even when I did the mm-hmm. second one, you know, I saw it. But then I didn't watch it for the longest time, you know. And mm-hmm. it's amazing that, the, that it's really coming back more so now than it ever has. I mean, I was never asked for the last. 30 years to do all these shows and you know once in a while I would do podcasts or do some interviews on the phone or whatever but now it's like the past few years just showing up at these shows where people just want your autograph and things like that I'm like really after all this time and it's amazing I mean the fans are getting younger and younger and it still has legs you know people still love that movie yeah I, I be, the original is my favorite movie of all time. I've been watching it since I was like three years old, and of course, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm glad that it, that the that the movie has had a, a lasting success and stuff. But a lot a lot of the fandom that's out there and stuff it turns me off a little bit. Just like I remember, you know, before the internet, when it was just you know a nice little intimate thing. You know, now it's just like everybody's into it. <laughs> I know, isn't it? I mean, just the collectors alone, you know, everything that they collect, it's, it's, when I see what they're giving me to sign, I'm like, oh, my God, how did you get this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, I mean, a lot of them devote their entire lives for collecting all this stuff and, you know, doing all that. And still, you know, our friend in, well, he is now our friend um, that is a promoter now in, in uh, France. He... He has a DeLorean, and he brings that around to different events and makes money just doing that. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a crazy thing, but of course everyone remembers uh, you you because you had that that rhino tusk ring on your finger and you grabbed Marty Junior's by the balls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny when we did one of those takes. He, um, I think it was the first take. He put a ketchup bottle in his pants. Really. And. <laughs> Yeah, so I, here I am, you know, filming. I was nervous. You know, it's my first film. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, um, you know, I go up to him and go, which one was like, you got no throat. And then when I, I caught it, it was huge, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then I just kept going because I didn't know if I could stop or not, but everyone started laughing. It was really funny. It was a joke. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty so, funny. Yeah. How was uh, Tom Wilson? Tom Wilson was so fun. I mean, um, he was just a character, you know, he's a comedian as well, so he would always just, you know, making us laugh, and, you know, we spent a lot of time together up in the air on those cover boards, you know, just hanging out all day long, and then we'd all just start singing songs, you know, just all start singing just by the time, but he was a fun character, and I'm glad he's finally going out there and seeing the fans that, you know, I think, you know, when actors don't really want to associate themselves after a while because, you know, they just get typecast with the character. But, yeah. you know, a lot of the fans are missing uh, <laughs> seeing him. And so now he's starting to go out, you know, the last couple of years, I think. Yeah, that's been great. I'm seeing... I haven't seen him. I mean, I haven't seen Tom since Back to the Future. And Michael, I just saw in New York last month, I happened to be walking past a restaurant and he was coming out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, there's Michael. So my friend's like, you have to say hello. And so I walked up to him and I said, hi, Michael. I'm Darlene Bobo. I worked on Back to Picture 2. I played Spike. And he said, oh, did you get hurt? And which was my stunt double. And I said, <laughs> no, that was my stunt double. But no, I'm fine. It's so good to see you. And then we talked about, you know, all these shows, the, you know, the musical, all the stuff that's coming up. But, you know, um, so yeah, it was really cool to see him after so many years, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I can't believe how, how brave he's been and just how he's been battling that disease. I know. I know, and Tracy was by his side, and she's, you know, such a force, you know? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, she's right there by his side. I think it's so, so wonderful. I, re- I remember seeing, when the movie first came out, a behind-the-scenes look, and they were showing the... the uh, the behind the scenes of the hoverboard scene. And I just, I can't believe how amazing it was, how everything was rigged like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It was, um, we went out and we were on a ranch and we were practicing everything and doing all the practice stuff. But, um, 
you know, and we had that unfortunate accident at the end and uh, with Cheryl Wheeler mm-hmm. and uh, who now I think you heard in the news that she was in some gun battle with her ex-husband and died. Oh, I didn't hear that. No. Wow. Yeah. Craziness. Um, really sweet, sweet girl. Um, well, first my stunt double was Lisa McCullough and uh, Lisa who also with my stunt double sometimes on Pacific Blue, my bike cop show, um, mm-hmm. she um, backed out of the stunt because she knew it wasn't perfected. And, uh, you know, because they've never done some kind of stuff like this. So when they actually were shooting it, you know, the crane was about 14 inches off, you know, when they were flying them. Mm-hmm. You know, if you watch the movie and the crash scene and just slow it down, you could see she, my character, hit the pole, the cement pole. It mm-hmm. rams into the pole. And then after that, she was supposed to go through the window, the candy glass, and drop down onto pads. Well, since the crane was off and she hit the thing, when they released them, mm-hmm. they didn't drop. They, two other ones dropped inside, but she dropped down 14 feet onto cement. Wow. And she ended up um, having multiple surgeries and things like that, but um, settled, you know, and everything. But... You know, she still had somewhat of a career after that, but not not much. But but then my dog is barking, so okay. but um, uh, yeah, but um, now she's gone. So craziness. Yeah, I've, I've talked to a lot of stunt performers. It's amazing what kind of lives they lead. You know. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, so you're definitely taking a shot, no matter what you're doing. Taking a chance on your life. Some of them stop when they get to a certain age, and some of them go until the day they die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have a friend who used to be a stunt double. I mean, a stunt guy, and then he was a stunt coordinator, and now he's in construction. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How was uh, Robert Zemeckis as a director? Oh, he was an amazing guy. So sweet and just. You know, he's the kind of guy that never raises his voice and is just so giving to actors. And, um, yeah, just such, just such a sweet guy. I mean, he was so, you know, I would say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, you know, there was so much going on with the lighting and the new camera and stuff like that. So he was just inundated with, you know, so many technical things with the camera and everything. So, you know. He didn't have a lot of downtime, per se. You know, this film was it was a new thing back then, what they were doing, and it was a lot on his shoulders, and he certainly pulled it off. Mm, he sure did. He's, he's yeah. one of those guys who just, you know, broke new ground at the forefront of technology. Right? I mean, for Bob Gale to come up with this whole script and these ideas, it's just insane. Like, a lot of these things came true, and, you know... But just the, the creativity of the script, it was just amazing. I mean, I think, I think that's why, you know, people still love it to this day, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's why I love it. Yeah. And, and then you did the classic ski school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did ski school. Um, that was like uh, my first lead in a film. And, um, yeah, going up to Canada funny, I'm still friends with a couple people from that um, movie, and actually one of them, his kids go to my school, it's very funny, but here we all met up in Canada, and uh, down here, but yeah, that was fun, it was a fun time, it was a great learning experience, Um, and uh, yeah, but you know, back then, there wasn't the internet and everything, so you never think that anyone's going to see these movies for so many years, and then there they are. Oh, I, I saw it when it was on Cinemax late at night when I was eight years old. <laughs> oh, my God. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of proof uh, to be watching at eight years old. That's if my son would have turned it off. <laughs> I, re- oh, I remember seeing boobs when I was like three or four. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. Dean Cameron. Yeah, funny. I was shooting a commercial like a couple of years ago, and the, and the executive the ad agency, she was like, Early, were you in ski school? I'm like, yes. And she's like, oh my God, that was our favorite movie in college. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. That was my first love scene I ever had to do, and it was so uncomfortable. I mean, they were like, 
only five people in the room, but Tom Bresenham, my fellow actor, he was so nice. He was just like, listen, don't do this, don't do that. Just cover yourself there. Because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? So awkward. Horrible. <laughs> so I was like, after that, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Too uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Dean Cameron, I reached out to him the, when I first started the podcast, and he replied me. Uh-huh. He replied me back. Uh, get back to me uh, the first of of, of, of t- first of 2018. And by the way, I hope I'm not being a dick by saying that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. I did, so then I did wait that long, and then I reached out to him again, and then he's like, "I don't, I don't know if like if, if I have a lot, if I have a lot to say, you know." And then I was just like, "All right." Um, <clears throat> Are you not, talking about Dean Cameron? About Dean Cameron, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dean and, and Stuart Bracken were so, um, it's so fun and so great to work with. And I remember, um, you know, they they couldn't believe that I never like knew about all these places on Hollywood Boulevard. And so when we came back from Canada, they took me to all the like places on Hollywood Boulevard, the Back Museum, the Blue Stone Frank, the Roosevelt Hotel. They mm-hmm. took me everywhere. I was pretty new. I mean, I hadn't been in Los Angeles that many years yet, so. Yeah. They were funny. They, those two were hilarious. I mean, a lot of that movie was improv by them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a pretty funny movie. Yeah. I remember um, you did a couple episodes of Full House. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, how was I remember that? that audition. Um, the, the executive producer had brought me in a couple times for stuff, and then he's bringing me in for this, and I'm like, oh, I'm never going to get this part. I don't look anything like Bob Saget. I'm supposed to be his sister. <laughs> and and I went into the room like I wasn't going to get the job, and he goes, that was a really good audition, Charlie. I'm like, yeah, right. He goes, no, really? I go, oh, well, okay, thanks. And I walked out, and then I ended up getting it, so... No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, usually usually when you hear that was a good audition, it means you didn't get it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I couldn't believe I got that. So, so I mean, that's when the Olsen twins were so young. They were, like, maybe five years old. And, you know, they were given their lines off camera because they were too young to even read, I think, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. So, yeah, they were just doing that. So It was a good experience overall. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I was. I was looking forward to working with a monkey because I never have. But then I heard that they could rip your face off. So then I was afraid to work with a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, yeah, it was a good experience. Um, you know, they've all been on that show for so long. I think they were kind of over it. And um, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> you did a very interesting movie called Ring of Steel. Yeah. 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 That, um, that was interesting. Um, you know, I was kind of upset with that movie because, you know, there wasn't a love scene in that movie. And when I got the role, and then they had to convince me to do a love scene and, you know, speak for European sales and stuff like that. And I was, they were like, oh, it's just going to be a silhouette. No one's going to see anything. And I'm like, uh-huh. And then the movie ended up I ended up losing, like, a huge job because of that movie because someone took a piece of it, you know, from the love scene and put it on and then, you know, it's taken out of context. And, you know, people are like, oh, what is she in, like, a soft porn movie, you know? <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, was, I had to write the company and tell them to take that clip off, offline and the whole thing. So, I mean... Over, I mean, when the, again, that was before the internet was even happening. We never thought that anyone would see this stuff, you know? Yeah. And that was my last time that I was ever going to do it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but it was very interesting with the sword fighting, and here I was just with a good girl in the movie, and then, you know, of course, it's a super best thing, but, um, but um, you know, Carol Ross and Joe John Baker was such a nice guy, so such a good actor, and, um, and I love Robert Chapin, who was my played the boyfriend. I mean, he is a real sword fighter. This is what he does, you know, with um, swords and fencing and stuff like that. And I got to learn how to fence, but I still learn. I, I still don't remember some of the moves because apparently I was a fencer in the movie, so that's how we meet. But you know, it's just 
interesting, you know, when you take these roles when you're young. They said, oh, it's a lead in a film. I want to take it no matter what it says. But now that I'm older, I go, no, it's past, 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 you know? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you can't be as choosy when you're young and trying to work. Yeah, like you got to be the fourth girl to play Angel. I, well, you know what's funny? Again, that movie was not an Angel movie when I booked it. It was called Assault with a Deadly Weapon. Mm-hmm. And then during a scene, the director says, okay, you need to do this line in the scene because in some countries, this is going to be Angel 4. And I go, what's the movie? <laughs> and he's like, yep. I'm like, oh, my God. But, um, yeah, didn't even know it was going to be an Angel movie. And um, at least I didn't have to do any less than that movie. Yeah, um, which is quite funny. Carlo, who's a really funny, funny guy, uh, sweetheart of a guy. And um, what was funny is another friend of mine I did a play with, she played an angel, or, or an angel friend, actually, one of those angel movies, too. So I guess those are pretty cult movies, too, but, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed two people from Angel 2 and the director of Angel 3. You're the first actual angel I've had on um, the I tried. I tried getting Donna Wilkes on. Uh, she never replied to me. Betsy Russell. I, um, I. I tried. She was kind of a difficult diva. And then um, the third one, who was on, oh God, what was on? What was that show? She was on. Oh, Silk Stockings. She was on. Um, she never responded either. But I'm so happy. At least I got you on. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, well. I, you know, I don't understand why would people do that. I mean. You know, I don't understand why people would turn things down like that. I never understand that when people are divas either, because you know what? Mm-hmm. You got to be humble in this field. You know, the, the people are not going to watch you one day, or people aren't going to hire you one day, and then you know, you look back and go, "Should have been hum- more humble." I mean, what I did, I did this pilot called "The Forgotten" for Christian Slater, uh-huh. and he had it worked in a long time because of his attitude and. Let me tell you something. When he shot this pilot, they were like, we'll do anything you ask. I mean, he was so humble. He was so sweet. He, like, did what anyone asked him. Because he knew. He goes, look, if I'm going to be an asshole, I'm not going to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I've, I've interviewed a couple of divas before, and but I've interviewed, for the most part, so many humble people that I just am like, oh, my God, it's, 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 like, a, it's like a gift from heaven, I think. Yeah. How how was working with uh, Roddy McDowell? He was he was actually a character. He just couldn't get over like when I was all made up. How much I looked like Sharon Tate, who he was a friend of. Mm-hmm. So he would always like take my photograph. He was can we do another session? I mean, he was a photographer as well. So we he'd always want to take my photos. I'm like, I wonder what those photos ever ended up. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, he was, he was a character. Really nice guy. Super nice. How about that, Samantha Phillips? Samantha Phillips is funny because I knew her back in New York days when I was there. So I already knew her. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then I worked with her on uh, CSI. Wow. It's I don't know what role she played, but yeah, she was in a CSI that I did as well. But yeah, we knew each other. But she's a hoot. She's still out there doing her thing, I think. Yeah, last... At the time, I don't think she was doing Playboy stuff when I knew her. Yeah, last September, I was at the Horicon Son of Monster Palooza in Burbank, and they were doing a full-fledged Phantasm reunion. And so everyone from Phantasm had, their, had, had a room, and... I go to meet uh, Kat Lester, who's in the first one, and Samantha is right next to her, right? So, like, I'm, I'm talking to Kat Lester because I love the first Phantasm movie so much. And Samantha, she's she's just, like, talking to me. She's, like, trying to talk to me while I'm, like, talking to her and stuff. And she was, like, making wisecracks and just being really funny. And then she ended up taking the picture of, of me and Kat. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like I'm not a big fan of the Phantasm sequels, you know. And I just wanted to talk to Cat. <laughs> right, right. It was pretty funny. I don't even know those. 
I loathe that show, so I have no idea. Yeah. You had a recurring role on Boy Meets World. Correct, yeah. Yeah, was that a good experience? Yeah, it was great. The kids were really cute. You know, they were really, you know, um, Ben Savage um, and all the other guys. And Fred Savage would always come visit the set. And um, Mr. Feeney, the guy that plays Mr. Feeney, he was really nice. Everyone was on nice on that. And actually, the producers of that show hired me a few times on other shows. So mm-hmm. it was a good experience. Yeah, it was a good show when it was on. Yeah, William Daniels, who played Mr. Feeney, he's a legend. Right, William Daniels, yeah. Mm-hmm, St. Elsewhere. I mean, I was still pretty green back then, you know? Yeah. And doing these sitcoms and stuff like that. I mean, I did a coach. I did the Charles in Charge. I think, um, yeah, Boy Meets World was still when I was pretty young. Mm-hmm. Still starting out, you know, still learning how to do all this stuff, you know? Yeah. How was working uh, with Peter Weller on Decoy? Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, um, he kind of like took control of everything. Um, you know, he was like rewriting the script and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, he worked. He was a good, he had a good work ethic and everything. And Robert Patrick was a dream. He was just amazing. He was a sweetheart. But, you know, it was you know, the circumstances were tough, too. You know, we're in this little town in Saskatchewan and, you know, Canada. And there's black flies everywhere. The mm-hmm. snow's everywhere. I mean, um, but, yeah, he was an interesting guy. Very, very smart. Incredibly smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's from, like, that, that class of guys like uh, Christopher Walken, who's, like, yeah. you, you know, got that intimidating yeah. presence on screen. Yeah, I haven't seen him in anything. Has he done anything lately? Um, I think he does like a lot of TV stuff and like you know, we live in a, in a world now where it's hard to get little films uh, dist, uh, dist- distributed, distributed, and I think he still does that that kind of stuff, but nothing of like right. high significance. Right. You know, but he's a great actor. Yeah, and Robert Patrick was just you know such a sweetheart. I loved him. He's, he's the, the, the bad cop in Terminator 2, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, he's got an intimidating presence on screen, too. Yeah, but he's not like that in person at all. He's such a down-home guy, you know? Yeah. I've, I've seen interviews with him. He seems like a teddy bear. <laughs> yeah. How did uh, Pacific Blue come to you? So that's a funny story, too. Um, You know, Paula Tricky, who was on... Um, she was calling me. She said, Darlene, the casting this, you know, role, the plot, and I'm actually, you know, I think she got it before me and um, the, the other role. And I said, oh, you know, I'm sure it's right for me. My agent will send me on it. And, and, she, and so she called me again. She said, Darlene, they're still looking for this girl. And so I called my agent. I said, look, they're looking for this girl, top one on the show, Cup of the Blue. And he said, oh, Darlene, they're looking like well, it's really tough you know, dicey character or whatever. And I go, well, I could totally play that. I'm a tough chick. I mean, I always play these nice, sweet girls, but really I'm more tough. I mean, those are the roles I like to play, strong mm-hmm. characters. And um, and he goes, and it's on cable. And at that time, cable was not big. You know, they had silk stockings and looked at Nikita, but it wasn't big. And I was doing all network stuff and pilots for network TV, and he just did not want me to go on it. And I said listen, I am done with auditioning. Uh, this is 13 on air. I want to work. I just want to work on a consistent job. So what was funny is not knowing this, that the producer mm-hmm. said he wanted my type. He knew me because I had auditioned for many times for like uh, Renegade and um, what was his other show? Stopping so. Renegade and something else. Oh, the Johnny Depp one. Oh, it's 21 Jump Street. Right. And I was so green back then. He never hired me. But um, he saw me at a fight in Vegas. And he was like, Jolene, I got this role that, you know, you're perfect for. And he was sitting right in front of me at the fight. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, great. But I was doing a pilot at that time. And it didn't go anywhere. But um, but he said, uh, he goes, yeah, you're perfect for it. So anyway, so... 
apparently I was the stereotype that he was looking for. I was like, yeah, we want a Darlene Bobo type, which I didn't even know that they were looking for a Darlene Bobo type. <laughs> so I went in and I nailed it, got the audition, you know, and, and booked it. And then um, I was like, this is a piece of cake, this job. I mean, this is totally me, that character, sarcastic, tough, whole thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, uh, then they didn't get the lieutenant yet. And I said, listen, Rick Rockovich, I just did, you know, a pilot with, and it didn't go. You might want to reach out to him. He's available. And so they did, and he got the part as a lieutenant. Mm-hmm. Was he good to work with? Yeah, I love Rick. I mean, he never knew his lines, but <laughs> <laughs> he would always best some of his lines, and he never knew them. And I'm like, oh, my God, Rick. I love Rick. He was one of my favorites. Sure. We were all such a tight family, you know, the first three years before they brought in the younger cast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we just had such a good time, and we were all so professional, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, then they let go of Marcos and uh, Rick, and then brought in the younger crew. And I actually was getting married at the time the fourth and fifth year, I was getting married to a hockey player back east, and so I was going to, like, only do a show part-time and, you know, stay back east, and the whole thing, and um, so then they were, you know, that's why I was only on the, on the show half the season, the fourth season, and only four episodes of the fifth season. So that, you know, never worked out, but... Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, so... But it was it was great. I I I love that show, and I'm still friendly with the crew. A lot of people that worked on that show, we are all still very tight. I speak to Jimmy once in a while. Um, he has a house in Costa Rica with Anna Marina, but that was just my favorite favorite show to work on. We just had we were such a family on that show. That's awesome. So, uh, are, you, are you still out there working? Yeah, I mean. I've been doing little bits here and there, um, still auditioning. Um, I was I just screen tested for the show, but I didn't get it. They went a completely opposite way. That seems to be my, you know, the problem right now, everything, especially TV-wise, is very ethnically diverse, and all the roles that I get usually go to an ethnically diverse person. Um, you know, the casting from the rookie brings me in. I mean, she brings me in, like, every other day for a part, you know, but it all mm-hmm. goes to ethnic stuff. They always bring it. I'm always the token blonde that they'll bring in. If they want a blonde, they'll bring me in. And um, I have, like, three movies that are, well, one's coming out called Day 13. And mm-hmm. there's a, another one called Spearhead Effect that is out on demand. And then also um, extracurricular activities that came out last year. And I also had a small part in, called The Wedding Year that just came out in October and November. Mm-hmm. I'm in the first scene of that movie. Um, uh, yeah, and right now, apparently, I'm on, am, um, brick-wise, I'm on an Amazon job that's at a train station in Boston, and we have a billboard here on the 405 freeway where I'm a biggest life on a billboard for Amazon. So, you know, I still get out there. I still work here and there. Um, and, you know, I have kids and raising my kids, and it commercially is dead because everything's gone non-union. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of a demise to the commercial industry, and most people are streaming anyway, so they don't want it to be commercial. So that's kind of taken a nosedive. Yeah, and I heard that uh, commercials don't pay like they used to anymore. No. Yeah, it's insane how everything just changed the whole business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even I don't even know how movies even get made anymore because I don't even know how people are making money at all. I know it's it's insane, and hopefully it's temporary. It'll turn around just like it did in the seventies. Yeah, I mean, even you know when they're casting you, they'll call something a co-star, which you get paid practically nothing, mm-hmm. opposed to a guest star. Like this last role I was screen testing for. I mean, it was a recurring it was a um, recurring role playing a character from the nineties, and you had like two major scenes. And they were calling it a co-star because they don't want to pay, you know? And it's like, and it's a big production, big TV show. And you're like, this is such BS, you know? Yeah. It's like, this is not a co-star. This is totally a guest star. I mean, I did the ranch 
with um, the Ashton Kutcher show, and I did a small part. I had like two lines, and they gave me a guest star at least on that because I was working alongside the guy in the He was my boyfriend. Um, but I had like nothing. Oh my God, the best guy, though. If you want to talk about the most giving, wonderful actor that's famous is Sam Elliott. Oh, yeah. He, I work, you know, he, every day I came on set for the ranch and he was like, are you okay, darling? <laughs> <laughs> is there, are, you, are they treating you well? And I was like, yes, thank you, Sam. He was just so amazing. He was such a great guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a great guy. I was so happy when he got that Academy Award nomination this year. I know. Yeah. It was long, long overdue. Long overdue, exactly. He's been he's been great in everything he's ever done. Everything, yeah. So, Darlene, there's this game that I like to play with my guests. It's a, a secret okay. silly. It's a secret silly game, and uh -huh. how this works is it's slumber party questions and. I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it. Okay. Okay. Darlene, are you ticklish? Only on my knees. <laughs> Tommy, are you ticklish? Oh, I am baby ticklish, yes. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite part of the body? My arm. What's your favorite part of the body? The belly button. <laughs> Why is that? I don't. It's it, it it's it's I don't know, I've always been attracted to it. It's it's like middle ground between being a private part and a non-private part. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I, there's no other way to put it. I just I've always loved them. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Smoking hot. Smoking hot. What color is are your? That's actually the name of the color. Um, what what are your toenails painted? They're not painted right now, but last time they were, they were pur purple with sparkles. <laughs> what would you say is your best personality trait? Who would I say is my best personality trait? Um, I would say that I'm a very giving person. I mean, I like to take care of what, how, if I can. Um, that's what people, most people say about me. You're so nice and you're so giving. Mm -hmm. What about you? What's your personality, that's your personality trait? Uh, same thing. I think I have a, a great sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. I yes, think. empathy, for, for sure. Yeah. For me, especially for animals, and because I'm a huge animal lover, and also... Uh, for my single girlfriends, I always like to make sure they're okay. But once they get married, I'm like, okay, you're good. You're taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um, being very giving is what everyone needs to try to be at, in this you know, strange time we're in. Exactly. I Like this morning, like uh, my neighbor texted me, oh, my God, come outside. There's a double rainbow. So I looked outside, and I said, listen, I'm off to Krispy Kreme to get um, green donuts. Mm -hmm. Like some, she's like, "Oh my God, yes!" So I ran to Krispy Kreme. I got a two dozen donuts, and I dropped them off at some of my neighbors who have kids, mm -hmm. and I left it on their doorstep. And I got a little leprechaun cake to your doorstep. So they were, it was really fun to do. Oh, I wish I, I wish I lived next door to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sweet. I would have gotten you some green donuts. Oh, thank you so much. And then uh, my favorite question. Is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Maybe it would be tar, or they're pouring tar. I cannot stand that smell, and I hate the smell of cigarettes. Oh, yeah. What about you? There's a stinky smell that makes you like, ugh. Uh, either farts or feet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you wouldn't survive in this house. My kids fart all the time. Really? <laughs> and the dog. Oh, my God, yeah. Oh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. But I can't say feet because my kids are obsessed with cleaning their feet, so that's a good thing. Except when my, after I pick my daughter up from soccer, they, they kind of smell. But, mm -hmm. you know, my son, he's got a foot thing. He will 
not even walk on bare floors with just his socks. He always has to have shoes on. So he's got like the softest feet ever and cleanest. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Darlene, I thank you so much for coming on today. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Yes. I'm so glad we got to do this. And you have yourself a great day and keep, you. keep you know, um, go, going out there and auditioning because you will get something eventually. Yes, always do. Yes. And, and I hope you're, you stay safe and healthy and much success to you with your podcast and everything else. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. All you, right. You have a good day and uh, try not to get too bored in our lockdown situation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting over a cold that's unrelated from the virus, so I'll just I be... can hear that. Yeah, I know, exactly. Are we friends on Facebook, Tom? Oh, that we can connect. Oh, okay. Well we should be friends on Facebook. If uh, you can just re uh, yeah. Okay, I'll send you the request. Okay. Okay, take care, hon. You too. Bye bye. All right, bye bye. Well, there you have it. Darlene Vogel. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, she is just a very kind, sweet lady, and she has great stories, and I just love that she's out there trying to, you know, keep her dream alive, plugging away, and also taking care of her family. I, I interview so many great people, I have to say. That is just wonderful. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>